Get the face behind the... <laughs> Uh, hey, a note to the video watchers. If you're watching this on the Daily Tech News Show channel, great. You don't have to pay any attention to the next thing I'm going to say. If you're watching this on the Ace Detect channel, uh, we are going to, I'm going to try to put these up, uh, but we're streaming them on Daily Tech News Show channel, so the official channel has moved. So you really should go subscribe to youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show if you want to get these videos the fastest way possible. Ready to do a audio podcast? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've done those. All right, here we go. And in through the nose, and out through the mouth. And remember, to find your inner peace, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. And now, your moment of zen. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 17th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, as he does most Wednesdays, Mr. Scott Johnson of the Morning Stream, The Instance, Boop, and more. Hi, Tom. Uh, missed you last week. Wasn't quite the same without you. Thank you for filling in quite admirably. Oh. Uh, thank Brian Ibbett for me as well. You guys rocked it. Yeah, we had a lot of fun, and I think it was... Um, it was it's always interesting to, whatever the rhythm of, a, of the usual day is, to mix that up with another person you're not used to doing that rhythm with, but someone you're used to having a whole other rhythm with and then trying to make that work. It was a fascinating experience, and I think it turned out good. So thanks for letting us take the wheel for at least a day. I think what you're trying to say is rhythm is going to get you. Yeah, that's always going to happen. Look, okay. if I learned anything from the 80s, it was that. <laughs> you are the Gloria Estefan of technology. <laughs> my friend. Uh, now, Scott Johnson has been covering E3 like a madman from the outside, uh, live streaming commentary of every freaking press conference. Raj Diut, writer at Reckoner, is here as well. He's been covering E3 from the inside. Uh, how are you doing, Raj? I am okay. How's that? <laughs> right. I, I, I'm tired. I'm having a lot of fun. But uh, jet lag's in there somewhere as well. So yeah, yeah jet lag, uh, travel halfway across the planet, and E3 just layered on top. That is a, uh, it's a hell of a combination. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, man. It's great to be here. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, virtual reality, uh, partly what we saw from it at E3, but also uh, talk a little bit about where it's going, where, where we think it's headed, whether gaming is even the right application for it. Uh, going forward, but let's start off with some headlines because we got big news about Microsoft. Ars Technica reports Microsoft made it seemingly yearly executive reshuffle. They always do it sometime in the summer. Uh, though Recode Zena Fried thinks it has more to do with people this time than strategy. Former Nokia CEO and head of Microsoft devices Stephen Elop is out again. Uh, and his devices division is now going to be rolled into the Windows group under Terry Meyerson. It'll be called the Windows and Devices group. Kirik Tatarinov leaves the business services uh, division. He was running Dynamics, and that will all get folded into the Cloud and Enterprise group under Scott Guthrie. Eric Rudder is leaving, and his education responsibilities move under Chi Lu in Applications and Services. All those folks leave today. Separately, Chief Insights Officer Mark Penn will leave in September and take his insights to Steve Ballmer back to digital marketing services company Stagwell Group. Oh, I was hoping he's going to go work with him with the Clippers somehow. <laughs> he'll take his insights to the Clippers as a point guard. Wow. Well, Microsoft's hurtling ever closer to services, not devices. Uh, Reuters reports the California Labor Commission has determined Uber drivers should be treated as employees, not contractors ongoing uh, thing in the world that is Uber versus governments. The ruling was filed Tuesday stating Uber, quote, is involved in every aspect of the operation and awarding $4,000 to Barbara Ann Berwick, a driver who complained Uber is appealing the award. Yeah, this is really interesting because, uh, not to get too far down the labor law side of things, you can't continue to pay for someone as a contractor just to avoid paying payroll tax and benefits. Uh, especially uh, in the state of California. And what Uber is saying is, hey, we're just a service. You know, your Uber drivers have a car. There's people out there who want to ride. We just provide the software that hooks them up. Uh, and the state of California is saying, look, maybe that was true once. We don't know. Actually, that's not what the state of California is saying. But what they are saying is that is not true. You pretty much set up everything for the drivers. And so they are de facto employees. And so you have to pay them as such. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 funny because it feels like they're going to have this fight state by state. Every state's going to be a little bit different. I bet they wish there was some sort of federal single point of entry on the law to say this is how it's going to be. But because we do this state by state, I feel like Uber's just getting started with this, and Barbara's probably not going to be the last one. Nest made some new announcements according to the Next Web. Uh, no more drop cam. It's just the cam. A 1080p successor to drop cam with night vision, a tripod, and a speaker you can talk through, all for $199. Uh, drop cam's cloud recording gets a name change as well to Nest Aware, and they upped your storage to 30 days for your $10 a month. It's also available outside the U.S. You can get it in the U.S., U.K., Canada, Germany, France, and the Netherlands today, or at least you can order it today, and it ships next week. The Nest Protect also got an update that makes it better at detecting fires which is the thing it's supposed to do. So that's good. You can also silence it remotely with an app coming next month for the same price of $99 as the old one. Nest also announced a home safety rewards plan, which gives you a 5% break on insurance premiums and a free protect if you're willing to share your data with insurance companies, Liberty Mutual or American Family. Would you do that, Scott? Mm. Would you hand over your nest data to an insurance company in order to get a 5% discount and a free protect? There's no other advantage, right? Like me trading on that information is just getting me a discount. Uh, I don't think so. I think I would not do it. Um, insurance companies already do some crazy things with my data. I don't know that I want to provide additional data to them to figure out ways to make it so that their scam, look at me, I'm getting on a soapbox. So their scam won't uh, bilk me out of more money than I should be paying for insurance. There. Yeah, but, but they're giving <laughs> you a discount, right? It's lowering your premiums. Raj, what do you think? Uh, it's interesting. I, I guess it's, it's a little uh, different for us in Australia. Um, we don't have any of the Nest products, really. So, and the, uh, the cam isn't, uh, isn't coming our way either. So... Um, so you're companies. just mad at Nest altogether, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. If they could get their act together and recognize another country besides the U.S., that'd be good. But uh, no, no, no. Um, I know a lot of people that have imported the thermostat and things like that. Um, the insurance stuff, ours is a little different to uh, American insurance, but it's still just as crazy in terms of things that they'll offer to get you in there. So um, I can see a lot of people just going, eh, who cares? They could, I'm getting money off, so why wouldn't I? But... Um, uh, I think some more uh, privacy-aware people are probably going to take it, uh, like Scott has, and um, and be a little more precious with the with the data they're providing. You make a good point, though. It's like a lot of this data that we are being asked to give up for a five percent break is probably data they're going to get somehow, some other way, if for insurance purposes. So. I guess maybe all I'm doing would be offering them the convenience of getting it quicker or easier, and then I get a break, and maybe it's all water under the bridge. But I don't know. It's insurance companies who rub me the wrongest in this world, in this life. And uh, so I feel like not giving them anything else. Yeah, you're saying they're like vampires. Don't invite them in. Or they'll exactly. Never leave. Also, I had a friend in uh, high school named Cameron, and we called him The Cam. So <laughs> take that back. So he can do a trademark uh, lawsuit in Utah. Indeed. I thought you were, were going to say you called him the insurance broker. <laughs> That's even cooler. Uh, Reuters is reporting the FCC has proposed a $100 million fine for AT&T over the way it informed unlimited users about speed throttling. Boy, do I agree with this. AT&T has 30 days to respond, after which the commission will review the proposal and make a decision. The FCC says AT&T did not properly inform customers when reductions uh, would happen and how much speeds would drop. That violates transparency requirements passed in 2010. Yeah, guys. so this is a net neutrality related decision, but not to the current rules that just went into effect next, last week. They're the part of the 2010 order under the previous FCC commissioner that didn't get struck down in court. And it doesn't have to do with net neutrality. It has to do with transparency. It's saying AT&T did not sufficiently alert customers to what they were up to. I agree, because I don't feel like I was sufficiently alerted back when I had an unlimited plan. I kind of feel like it, it, they sufficient, they, they, that they probably met the letter of the law. I don't like the plan any more than anyone else does, but I find it hard to believe that anyone was actually confused by the way they worded it. With, with more competition in any given space of any business, the, the advantage of that is that if somebody's being lousy about communicating with you or only adhering to the letter of the law, you have another place you can go where they're taking a closer interest in you as a customer, you're having better customer service. But in 
limited options world that is mobile connectivity, they, they have to have their hand forced sometimes to be clearer than just the letter of the law may allow because we don't have another choice where somebody can swoop in and say, we like you so much, we're going to make sure we tell you everything up front or what other, whatever other better service we're going to give you. So, so, you know, they have to understand or at least they have to not be surprised that there's pressure on this because, you know, there's just aren't a lot of other options. There's one or two other things you could do and that's it. Excuse and, and just, yeah, sorry, ahead, excuse, excuse my ignorance. Like in, in Australia, we only have one internet provider that offers an unlimited plan. So is this, are we talking about internet or are we talking about mobile data? We're or? talking about mobile and it oh, has yeah. to do with grandfathered in people where they had unlimited and AT&T changed the plan to say, okay, you've got unlimited still, but at a certain point, we're going to throttle you down to a slower speed. Right, which, which is what a lot of Australian services do with bandwidth, internet, mobile data, and things like that. They don't actually advertise it unlimited and then change it later on because we've never really had the, the bandwidth provided as unlimited in the first place. So um, a couple of companies get around it in uh, Australia using what they call an acceptable use policy uh, where once, you know, you're streaming stuff for three days straight and they see that spike, they may come in and intervene on your account or you've downloaded two terabytes in the month and, and perhaps that's a little little crazy. So, um, But then we have an industry ombudsman that you can take those complaints to as well. Um, it's, we do too. It's called the FCC. Yeah. <laughs> this is such uh, what happened here. Yeah. So it, it, it's an interesting concept. One that we don't would have been nice if we had the same same issue, but uh, because we've never had that unlimited thing to deal with. Um, yeah. Consider yourselves lucky is what I'm getting. <laughs> it's a nice and, problem to have had. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and just to, be, to repeat what Scott said, Reuters reported FCC proposed a $100 million fine. They haven't levied the fine. You'll see headlines all over the place today saying AT&T slapped with fine. They have not yet been fined. So in 30 days, when the FCC rules on this again, and you're like, I thought they already were fine, just know that's why they're waiting for AT&T to defend themselves, basically. The Verge reports Amazon is updating the Kindle Paperwhite today with a new 300 pixel per inch display. That's twice as sharp as the last iteration and pretty much equal to the $199 Kindle Voyage. The new Paperwhite, though, only sells for $119. So right now, if that's the only reason... You were getting a voyage. You might as well get a paperwhite. You can pre-order today for shipping by the end of June. Well, Tom, I'm in this problem spot where I'm kind of hooked on a Nook for some reason, and I think part of it is because it, it does kind of what I need. It's a nice device. It reviews well, um, and what it lacks in terms of the robust ecosystem that is Amazon, it makes up for in things like I can do, you know, I very easily get an ebook from somebody because EPUB formats are supported and sort of drag and drop and all that. But that is really tempting, and I was... Just about to pull the trigger on the on the sort of backlit competitor that, that Nook has, and now I mean that's a screaming deal for a much better display. Ugh, crap. All right, that's why I come on the show. Now I know what to buy. <laughs> that's right. In uh, Gadget, report, <laughs> Gadget's reporting, Dropbox has announced a new way to request files from multiple people called file requests. Oddly enough, <laughs> one link sent to multiple people lets them all upload to the same folder with a maximum capacity of two gigabyte. Uh, none of the senders need to have a Dropbox account, it turns out. Pro and basic accounts get the feature today, and business users get it in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's actually very cool and collaborative and something I will use. It's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Intel acquired Canadian smart eyewear maker Recon, according to CNET. Recon's Jet glasses are $700, have a built-in display to show directions, activity statistics, smartphone connectivity for text and notifications, and camera for photo and video. The Recon team will partner with Intel's new devices group to develop new wearable technologies. Intel really wants to be ahead of that game. Uh, terms of the deal weren't disclosed, so we don't know exactly how much they paid. Uh, AMD has unveiled several new uh, GPUs, three to be exact, under the Fury name. Saw some of this last night on the PC conference that they had for E3. According to Ars Technica, the flagship $649 R9 Fury X and the $549 R9 Fury and R9 Nano. Uh, these are all based on the Fuji chip and update to this uh, GCN architecture. I want to say GNC because that's where I get pills. Uh, and will feature 4 gigabyte of on-package high bandwidth memory. The RX Fury X is comparable to the NVIDIA's GTX 980 Ti, which was currently the big granddaddy with a 4,096 4, stream processors, or excuse me, 4,096 stream processors, up to 1,050 megahertz core clock speed, 
256 texture units, 64 render output unit, 512 gigabytes of uh, memory bandwidth, and 67.2 gigapixel per second fill rate, and six phase, phase, phase <laughs> voltage regulation module for overclockers. Good lord. It also has a water cooled 120 millimeter radiator. Uh, saw some of the stuff close they were showing it during that conference. It was pretty impressive. Anyway, uh, the R9 Fury will be air-cooled version of the R of the Fury X and the R9 Nano, a low-power GPU based on the same Fuji processor. The uh, Fury X launches June 24th, so coming right up, and the Fury on the 14th and the Nano sometime in the summer. It's the Fiji processor, right? Do I keep saying Fuji? Yeah, Fiji. Yeah, why do I keep saying Fuji? It's because you're a big fan of the band. I think and so. just want them to have have their due. I like the film. Maybe just I want think to. of the water. It's water cooled. <laughs> yeah, it's now cooled with me. Fiji water. That's like exactly your, right. I like your uh, your hooked on phonics method, but I could have used it <laughs> half an hour ago when I started. <laughs> anyway, those cards uh, do look pretty impressive, and it's good to see some. I think real. It's interesting. I feel like they've been lagging behind Nvidia with the competition lately, and this puts them kind of on par. So I guess good on them. Yeah, it's also the next good web. For Oh, sorry. It's also good for a price war as well. The NVIDIA stuff's been far too expensive too. Yep. Yeah, 100% agree. Next Web researchers, uh, Next Web reports researchers from Indiana, Georgia, and Peking universities demonstrated a vulnerability they call Zara, X A R A, in the OS 10 keychain that would allow attackers to gather passwords. Uh, the group essentially created a malicious app, got it accepted into the OS 10 app store, and because OS 10 has no way to verify which app owns which credentials in the keychain. That app could get access to every password stored after it was installed. Good news was it couldn't get access to the stuff from before it was installed still. Uh, they also demonstrated another attack that spoofs URLs to steal a private token because OS 10 doesn't check which apps are allowed to use which URL schemes. A group notified Apple of the issue on October 15th of last year and Apple asked for six months to fix it and uh, with the publication today the group says the problem still is in existence in both 1010.3 and 1010.4. I was wondering why they're so slow on that. They don't seem like in impossible tasks to fix in the OS. I don't know why that would take so long to, to, to do it. I'm having a similar problem, a GPU problem, specifically with the current version of Yosemite, and Apple's just like quiet on the issue. They know it exists. They know something needs to be done. It's kind of a production machine problem, and they, just, I don't know, they, they, they're weird with that. Slow with those updates. I don't get it. Anyway. They feel like it must be deprioritized. They're, they, usually what happens in these cases is they say the, the actual chance of someone taking advantage of this and doing it is low enough that we're going to put it down behind some other things we're going to do. I guess I can see that. Uh, good news, drone fans. Hey, drone fans. Good news. The next web reports that, that all congressional hearing are at, excuse me, at a congressional hearing on Wednesday. Senior FAA official Michael Whitaker, we've talked about him before, said commercial drone regulations, quote, will be in place within a year, unquote. It's awful speed compared to how they usually move. On top of that, Amazon's vice president of global public policy said, we'd like to begin delivering to our customers as soon as it is approved. We will have it, the technology that is, in place by the time any regulations are ready. Now, I have a question about this, and I can't let this pass without asking it, because I don't hear anybody talking about this. When a drone flies into my neighborhood and comes to my porch to drop down to give me my toilet paper or whatever I ordered, right? When that happens, what is to stop the brat 13-year-old jerk kid up the road from BB gunning that thing or throwing a web over it or kicking it off the thing or trying to steal the drone? Like, that, that is a problem, man. Obviously, uh, anti-aircraft uh, defense missiles, rail guns will be installed on all Amazon drones. <laughs> No one ever talks about this, though. They talk about this convenience. Well, listen, I mean, it's the same. It's, but, but it's not any different issue than if the UPS guy drives up and drops something on your porch, what's to stop the kid next door from running over and taking it? Well, that I get. It's the drone I'm worried about. Like, well, there's, it's no different. It's like, what's to stop somebody from doing something bad to the thing? Yeah. People don't throw nets over the, uh, the postie, though, do they? Not <laughs> often. <laughs> it's a good point. It creates or, or, quite a visual, but... What, what happens when a drone lands and someone's dog attacks it and the blades actually hurt the dog? Yes. I, we, in all seriousness, uh, I wouldn't be too shocked if these... Well, first of all, quadcopters are probably going to have... They're, gonna, they're not going to work as well because they're going to have the guards around the blades for that very fact. My, my guess is when they first implement these, these drones will be carrying the packages to particular sites to speed up delivery and then this and and then they will 
be the finished delivery will happen by a person Many at least distribution the centers or something. Uh, but you know you guys you guys sound like folks in the 1800s like what are these these <laughs> automobiles uh they belch out smoke they scare the horses uh they're horrible i mean these are not unsolvable problems that's a really good point and you know somebody i just got a text from a friend who's listening to the show live and he suggests that maybe some of these early ones will drop kind of winch style lower these packages release them you know an inch before the cement or whatever and then never touch the ground and perhaps be less vulnerable that way i just know people get hackery and they want to do stupid well, stuff and as tv's egon points out it's also against the law so if somebody <laughs> does it they can be prosecuted and yeah. fined and possibly thrown in jail i mean so, so like a seal team coming in at night the drone will just sort of fly into your neighborhood and <laughs> drop its payload and then just yeah which is also a little <laughs> creepy so <Yeah. laughs> I'm ready to uh, bring it. I'm, I'm excited about it. I was, I was shocked by two things in this story. One, that the FAA actually seems like they'll get their, their rules in place. Uh, and two, that Amazon is ready to, to implement this. That's why I'm skeptical. I'm like, they're not going to implement it the way it looked in that video we saw where it just, the drone just flies up to your house. It's going to be some, it's going to be some step towards that. Yeah. They're not, they can't be ready for that yet. I don't think. Time now for some news from you. Uh, we get all kinds of news items from our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. So go there and join in the fun. If you haven't already, vote some stories up. It helps us figure out what to put in the show. Andrew Daly sent us this one from Ars Technica about an exploit in the customized version of the SwiftKey keyboard that's bundled in with the Samsung Galaxy S6, S5, and a few other Galaxy models. When downloading updates, the Samsung devices don't encrypt the executable file. And that means that if somebody's in the middle, they can do a little person-in-the-middle attack to modify upstream traffic. Exploit was demonstrated Tuesday at the Black Hat Security Conference in London by Ryan Welton, a researcher with security firm Now Secure. SwiftKey said in a statement that its Google Play and iOS versions are not vulnerable. So it's just the modified one Samsung packs in. Also, you don't have to have the keyboard active. It's the update that causes the problem. And you can't turn on the updates. You can't uninstall it. Samsung has apparently shipped a patch to wireless carriers, but it's unknown if that patch has been applied yet. It's that weird ecosystem where stuff can get hacked around with and forked and messed with, and then you got to worry about 10 versions. And It's another of those deprioritized, like, oh, how often is somebody going to do that with the keyboard? We'll worry about that later. Uh, oh, my turn. Hey, check this out. DVD Mon. My, my initials are messing. It threw me off. Uh, DVD Mon. Hey. <laughs> Sent in a, a tech nerd article that the European Court of Human Rights has decided that Delphi uh, AS, AS, I guess, versus Estonia. I think it's Delphi AS. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one S. Uh, <laughs> that websites can be liable for user comments. Ooh, my gosh. This always happens in Europe. Uh, the court found the original article published by Delphi was balanced. It ruled that since the site wanted comments and made monies off those page views, it incurs liability for what the, uh, the uh, commenters ever wrote. The ruling also finds that since Delphi couldn't, could remove comments, its filter uh, wasn't good enough to catch all the offending comments, and some comments were anonymous. Delphi is liable. Uh, Delphi, I guess. Europe, or excuse me, Europe has no equivalent to the U.S. Uh, rules when it comes to safe harbor. Um, this yeah, is so essentially this court said... Well, you're a big company, you make a lot of money off things, and you knew people were going to comment, so you're liable for any comments that were in there. And in fact, because you had a filter running that didn't catch some comments that you had to pull later upon request, uh, you're liable for those comments because your filter wasn't any good. Basically, they took every argument that could possibly be made one way or the other and made it work against Delphi. And this, this could have some, some pretty bad precedent effects uh, I don't know exactly how bad, how, you know, how this works in Europe, but uh, it, it removes safe harbor if you're a large company. What's the, is, it, is this ringing any like, similar bells as to the way things work in Australia uh, down no, there? This, you know, this sounds uh, slightly insane to me. Uh, I don't know if anyone else feels the same way, but um, especially with our major newspapers that have commenting sections on them that don't require any verification of who you are or, you know, you just pop in a nickname and you pop in what you want to say and I guess they approve them these days because it had so many that were uh, offensive or um, just spam I guess uh, but what, what, what happens to a company like Discuss if something like this comes through the US um, and everyone's WordPress blog that implements commenting? Well immediately you start to think about all the 
things you could call commenting in our forums, a form of commenting is uh, somebody's editorial uh, space on some website. Is that commenting? Like, at what point do you, do you start to have weird definitions of what is commenting and what the site should be responsible for? And then are you just creating a chill effect that says, well, then nobody should have any discussion at all, uh, or otherwise the sites are all liable for some terrible thing some guy said? Like, I, to me, it gets really complicated really quick, and I'm always surprised by these. Not this, this isn't really a ruling, I guess, but a, but a, you know, to to hear these kinds of things happening overseas, I'm like, well, what kind of internet are you using? I thought it was the same one. It throws me off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have thought that U.S. free speech would have just covered this off and pretty much, you know, prevents it from coming over to to America. In Australia, we don't have those exact laws, but <clears throat> a similar. It's not even a First Amendment issue in the U.S. There's a the uh, um, uh, the CDA, I think. Is, is the bill that has the safe harbor provision that says, look, if you're allowing the public to post, you're not responsible for what they post at, uh, up front. You're only responsible if someone says it needs to be taken down to take it down. Like, can a city be held responsible if somebody blows themselves up in the middle of it? Isn't sure. that the same idea? You crea- that's essentially what, uh, what this court is saying is, well, you created a big city and invited people to come in, and you made it really inviting for someone to blow themselves up, so it's your fault. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, real quick, we moved on from it real quick in the headlines. Uh, my mistake there, I, wa- I want to revisit the Microsoft shakeup real quickly before we get to virtual reality, because uh, there's some Kremlinology here. And like I said, Ina Fried thinks it's personality related, but a lot of people are saying it's strategy related to see the devices group rolled into Windows. And I want to get your guys' real quick impression. Because to me, when I first read this, it was very clear. Okay, Stephen Elop was Balmer's guy who brought the devices business into Microsoft. Satya Nadella, very platform-oriented, very cloud-oriented. Doesn't want to kill the devices, but doesn't see it as big of a deal. They agree to disagree. Stephen leaves. Devices go under Windows, and it fills into the Satya mania uh, of, hey, we want to make things work for everybody, and we'll make a few examples as devices rather than we're going to be a big devices company. Uh, but Ina Fried says it seems like it might just be more about people uh, and Satya Nadella organizing his team with the people he wants to have on it. Well, is it so, so in other words, it's not necessarily um, an overall push for him to get everything toward services and platforming and that sort of thing, and and not necessarily him saying, well, we need to dump all our hardware initiatives. It just could be that he needs the people around him like any other company, when you see these shakeups, this could just be, I need the right people doing the right things in the right places. I think that's probably, it's, it's always some of it. Even if this truly is him saying, I'm more cloud-oriented, I need people who are, so I'm moving and shuffling them around to make that You're happen. Right, it could be both. That's a good point. Yeah, it feels like both. Raj, do you have any, any thoughts on it? Uh, I think, I mean, he's been in the job now for a little while, and it's not un- unusual for a CEO to come in and, and move his team around to, to see make things the way that he wants them to run or they want them to run with the right people in the right places under their new governing rules. So I don't think it's uh, anything too ludicrous um, and to be looked into too far, but it's just another corporate shake-up. So you don't think they'll be airbrushing Stephen Elop out of photos that were taken previously? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, they probably do that with a lot of farmers' photos of developers <laughs> they might. if they could, yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about virtual reality. This was supposed to be the, the dominant theme at E3. And when you look at the press conferences, they got mentions, but we didn't get a lot of news. Uh, even what could have been the, the biggest bombshell, the fact that Microsoft is cooperating with Valve on its VR platform, didn't mention the Vive by name and didn't have any details, and you didn't hear Valve make a peep about it. Uh, so let's start with you, Raj. From somebody who was walking the floor at E3, how big did virtuality, virtual reality seem there? Um, it's, it's, it's present. Uh, it's bigger than last year. Oculus were the main players last year. But that said, Morpheus was being shown by Sony, and there was a line going around the convention hall and back again, all waiting to check out Morpheus. But it was a new kid on the block, and, and no one had really had a chance to play with it. This year it's there again. Sony have a big double story uh, stand on the floor and they're showing off a couple of the games that they mentioned in the in their briefing. And then there's Oculus again with another double story stand. Seems to be the common thing this year. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and they've got their new controllers in a showcase there. They've got Samsung Gear VR, which they power as well. Um, and then there's a couple of smaller players about the place. Um, Microsoft uh, almost have nothing VR-ish on the floor. Um, I'm sure the HoloLens is burrowed away behind closed doors somewhere. Um, and if that was if that was on the floor, it'd be like Morpheus last year, I'd imagine. It it it's the one everyone's buzzing about, and talking about, whether it's game related or not, or in a games context. That's something that's still up for debate. Um, and then HTC or Valve with their rig, nowhere to be seen. Um, not at the conference at all. Uh, it it. It's not something everyone's clamoring to get get to this year, which is interesting, especially because we were expecting so much out of those conferences. And and like you said, that Microsoft line during their briefing was was almost a throwaway. It's like, oh, you know, we've already announced all that stuff with Oculus. By the way, we're doing HTC as well. But you yeah. know, let's move on. Let's get what's, to the games. what's weird about that in that conference, and maybe you can speak to this. Were you at the you were at the Microsoft conference, right? I was at yes, yeah. Okay, so when they brought that up and they said you know, they, I think the word was partnership with Valve and Valve VR. Um, a lot of people took that to mean, oh, well, uh, we're getting VR on, on Xbox, uh, Xbox, Xbox. And, I've, got the, I've got the actual line, Scott. It was, we're working closely with Valve to make Windows 10 the best platform for VR gaming. Okay, so that's their, ter- that's their terminology, and that's a thing to say, I suppose. But did anyone in their right mind anywhere on this planet think that we wouldn't be able to run the Vive or the Oculus Rift or any other PC-focused device on a Windows machine. Like, I understand it's 10, and I understand it's them saying, well, we want it to be the best it can be, and that's a lot of PR talk, but that was like announcing that uh, we want to announce today that every HP laser printer you buy is going to have drivers and windows. (laughs) Like, of course it's going to work. That's the platform you're releasing the freaking thing on. It, that, it, I don't know why that annoyed me so much, but to this moment, I'm still annoyed by the, by the tone of that, or, or at least the implication that there was a greater um, you know, special relationship happening there. That, that, that's not. It's not them saying, oh, we're going to do special things with the vibe. It's them saying it'll work on Windows. I, I think when, when it was said um, in, in the crowd, there was sort of a lot of looking to the person next to you going, what, what, what did they just say? Did, they, what, did I miss something? Um, and because it was spat out so quickly and moved on, um, it probably is about as relevant as what you're talking about, Scott. It's, it's really just, yes, you can plug the HTV, HTC Vive, Revive, whatever it is, into a Windows 10 PC, and it'll work. Um, but beyond that, the partnership with Oculus, which was announced the week prior, uh, it seems to be a much more solid partnership, the supplying of the... Um, the Xbox controller or the Windows controller, whatever you want to call it, in the pack uh, that's going to come out into homes. The streaming of uh, games into the, from Xbox via Windows 10 into the device. Um, I think that's, you know, obviously a much tighter relationship between the two companies than, yeah, sure, you can plug in the HTC device and it's going to work. Well, that's the closest, though, that we can call a Microsoft or an Xbox VR initiative is that because you're going to be able to stream Xbox games to a PC, which was already a known thing, and that you could, in theory, wear an Oculus Rift headset and therefore, and the truth is you could probably do this with the Vive as well because it wouldn't, it wouldn't change, you know, it wouldn't matter which headset you're using, but you'd watch, I don't know, Halo, you could look at Halo 5, which was not built for VR experience, but you could still watch it through that headset, get all sick and wish it was something else, that that is not much of a VR initiative, and I was I was disappointed with that because it I, I don't know what I, I don't exactly know what I expected because what Hololens showed on stage was really really impressive. It's still questionable how that's a game or how Minecraft is any more enhanced by using it. It's more more like it's just like this weird viewer, but nonetheless that was super impressive. And while that's not Xbox related either, at least that was like okay, well this is something they're doing here. But the VR side, it just felt like they didn't have anything. Do you think? having been there, do you think this is a sign of Microsoft licking their connect wounds and saying, we were so fast to spend so much money to as quickly as we could get into the motion control world, which now has gone flat, nobody cares about. Uh, do we really want to risk all that investment, time, and commitment 
to a product, to a VR product that we're not even sure VR is going to be a gaming focused device or not, is this them just playing it safe? Uh, potentially. I think Connect did not get a single mention. There is not a single Connect I've seen on the showroom floor, not in a Microsoft booth, not in any of the third party booths that I've walked past. Microsoft did come out after the briefing and say we've got a bunch of Connect titles in the pipeline. It's not dead. Um, but you're right. They've spent so much money, time. They include. They bundled it with the Xbox One originally, um, and they, they prob- they've lost out big because of it. Uh, it. It's not a bad technology. It just wasn't marketed, or titles weren't created that utilized it in a way that gamers were hoping it was going to be used. And with VR now, I think you're right. I think they probably do need to play it safe uh, rather than jumping headstrong into it because when we look at Morpheus, which is what Sony's done, they've, they've jumped headstrong into VR. They've, they've put a lot of eggs in this basket now. The titles that have come out at this E3 are okay, but they're not really, uh, besides sort of like an E Valkyrie, which is you're seeing on all of them, um, there, there's nothing that's blowing anyone's mind. And the hardware is probably the worst of the lot now because they, they went so fast, so quick to getting something in and to market without taking the steps that someone like Oculus has done or Valve has done developing their own with a partnership, hardware partnership with HTC. That all brings up to me the fact that you know, combining that with the idea that you're, you have to do workarounds to get a real feeling of resistance. In fact, Rich from Lovely Cleveland wrote in pointing out that that's why AR might be more appealing to a company like Microsoft, uh, is that you can interact with real world uh, objects easier. Uh, the fact that you really can't do first person shooter very well yet in virtual reality. You can't move that quickly. You can't swing and target that quickly without losing your lunch, uh, even at 90 hertz, even, even probably at 120 hertz. I wonder, do you guys think, it, I'm not saying gaming won't be big on virtual reality, but do you think that it is not the main reason virtual reality headsets will take off? And if so, what, what will make it take off? Because we didn't see anything that made me think, oh yeah, that's what virtual reality is for. Well, I would, I would lay down that, that I'm with you on this question as, as not just a question of hypotheticals, but actually I'm genuinely in the, in the camp of thinking it won't be the main application or at least it won't be initially. I think it's going to take a long time for developers to wrap their head around this thing and figure out a way to make it be to gaming what other things have been to gaming because it's not immediately obvious. But what is obvious is exploring spaces you couldn't physically be in otherwise. Uh, Being in a small ship in space and looking at the largest red dwarf and comparing it to planets near it and flying from one to another and and having, um, for lack of a better term, museum experiences where you get to observe a lot of things and places and, and people. Uh, that, I think, is going to be huge. Interactive chat rooms would maybe be part of that, like the communication stuff. Like, I, I mean, I think you're basically answering why Facebook gives a crap about VR and why they bought the thing in the first place. Um, and I think that those are going to be the killer apps, at least out of the gate. Later, you'll see game experiences that will maybe not blow our minds at first, but will eventually become okay, this is how we've gotten around it. Just like we have touch screens, just like we have controllers, you know, we figure these things out. Raj, what's your, uh, what's your take on all that? Uh, I think you're right. Gaming, in, in terms of VR, is a, a pet project at the moment. It's the Apple TV of the hardware lineup. It, it's, um, it's something we all want and we all, we all expect it's going to be amazing, but we haven't found that, that golden product that's really shown it off uh, to consumers and made us all go, oh my god, I have to get a VR headset, I have to get an Oculus. Um, what, what Oculus are doing at the moment, uh, at the same time, is they've, they've launched the studio store, uh, sorry, Story Studio division, which is creating these um, miniature films. Um, the, 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 the latest one is a little title called Meet Henry. Um, they've got like a Vimeo trailer up, and it's basically an interactive story told through the Oculus Rift. Um, of this uh, this little guy Henry, a, a porcupine uh, who's trying to have a birthday party, but you know keeps popping all these balloons with his his spines and uh, his spikes, and everyone all he wants is a hug, but no one wants to hug him. Like it's this cute little um, kid story, and and in that virtual reality environment, you get to explore his world as the story's told, and look around and interact, and that storytelling system is an experience that 
we, we don't have today, and that could be the product that that gets us across the line. If, if the, these interactive uh, environment worlds of, of, of film. Um, it could be the, the, the next big thing for, for VR and, and those experiences. You still look like an idiot wearing these things. <laughs> That's one big thing that we can't get past either. You see people at, at, at the show, at E3, at any of these events, you've got a bunch of people sitting down in comfy chairs looking around with these huge refrigerators strapped to the to their head. Uh, all the work they've done with ergonomics has helped, but you st- people uh, are, are still looking strange. And they talked about it in one of the uh, briefings. Sitting down with your friends, I think it was the Morpheus one, sitting down at home, experience things with, with your friends. Four of you sitting next to each other on a couch, all with Morpheus's strapped to your face. Like, it just seems stupid. But well, I, I think we're at the point with virtual reality where we don't know what it's good for and it may be good for something we haven't invented yet and maybe that interactive storytelling sort of points the way which is not video game because it's not quite as complex as we're used to with video game but not just movie either because it has an interactive element to it and it makes me think when we first had moving pictures they were called moving pictures because everybody thought of them as photographs that moved And if you look at all the early versions of a film, it was all stills with things moving through it, right? You know, people walking out of a factory or or a horse, you know, galloping by. And it wasn't until later that people realized, oh, we can do something new now that we've never been able to do before. And it's storytelling, so it's similar to books, but it's also visual, so it's similar to photographs, and we created something new, the movies, right? I, I think that may be the answer with virtual reality is we have to create a new thing that we use it for. I, I think that that's, that's true. Uh, um, it, it's, it's so early. It, everything's early days. It, I, I know everyone's chomping at the bit. They want these devices. They want them to be amazing. But everything is being figured out. And like you said, that, that, that big hit is, is going to come in the future and with the evolution of the hardware as well. There, there's still no tactile feedback in, in any of these, you know, like I'm picking up a flower inside of VR, I don't actually feel the flower, and that's that's a disconnect that we're, we're, we're having to get past in weird sort of ways. And even things such as camera angles is, is something that game developers are working out now that a, a one-to-one relationship with you being the character isn't necessarily the best way of doing things. Um, a lot of these new titles coming out have you... Uh, the main character in a, a third-person view, which allows you to view and experience the environment whilst relieving you of the motion sickness of, of the main character's vision um, because you're looking at them and focusing your, your vision on them as they move throughout the world that you can experience in a 360-degree environment. So things like this are, are getting worked out and will build to the ultimate experience or ultimate application of VR in the years to come. Um, and we're unfortunately going to have to have a hit and miss to get there. Uh, and whether you want to adopt it early and be potentially a part of the misses, that's that's early adopters 101. So. Yeah, I think the stuff that will just kill it out of the gate is, Scott, walk, enter this space that takes you to the, the pyramids of Giza and uh, sit in this little roll cage and rise to the top of one and hang out there and see what that view would be like and you know, accurate recreations of parts of the world you'll never see, undersea exploration that you would never be able to do on your own, things in space that you would never do in your lifetime. Those kinds of applications are going to inspire generations of kids and adults uh, to the point that they'll VR will get so much focus from just those less twitchy, active experiences in just the feeling of exploration. That's going to inspire a whole new kind of game thinking. So, so I'm with you. Games will come. It's just going to start with this stuff. And I'm just as excited about that stuff. None of this disappoints me. All that disappointed me was Sony barely even talking about Morpheus. I know it's hard to demo on stage, but still just barely making a mention, having it be such low profile. If we're really on to the verge of something big here, go ahead and embrace the other applications. You don't have to tell me that Halo 5 is coming out for it. Just tell me that it's rad and you can do all these other neat things and I think that's enough to sell the to sell it to people. That's what I want this fall, and that's what I hope I get. 
All right, uh, real quickly, our pick of the day comes from Brian. Uh, couldn't agree more. He recommends Security Now, Twit's uh, fantastic educational podcast with a large, still relevant backlog. Has all kinds of good info from how networking works to how operating system works, along with current news and updates. Uh, you heard all the security issues that we were talking about in the headlines today, uh, and it is a great resource. So check it out, Security Now, twit.tv slash SN. And send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Uh, that's it for today. We got a few messages, but I'm going to hold them for tomorrow uh, because they're not necessarily totally on fleek. Is that what we say? Sure. That, am I using that right? No, I, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't even try. Uh, thanks, Raj Dayut, for joining us today. Writer at Reckoner uh, in, in Australia. Uh, jet setter around the world. Uh, what have you got to tell people about that they can go uh, find out what you've been doing online? Uh, they can check out my Twitter at Raj Deut, R A J D E U T. Uh, if you have had not had enough E3 coverage and you want to check out more, by all means, check out my E3 briefings roundup, which had me writing until 1 a.m. last night uh, at reckoner.com.au. Um, and Tom, your eyebrows are on fleek. That's that's how you might use that one. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm I'm happy to to know that they are on on fleek. Scott Johnson. Your whole body's on fleek. Mm, it is on fleek. Uh, yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to remind people about something. So today was the 14-year anniversary of my webcomic, My Extra Life, at myextralife.com. I'm really proud of it. I think 14 years is great. We've got a Kickstarter for a collection book coming up soon. But today, right now, if people like that work and they want to go get some prints, because I do a lot of prints based on my work, over at frogpants.com slash store, where you can hit the store link on the myextralife.com page, it will take you to a place where you can buy prints today only for 14% off. All you got to do is use the code uh, EL. Hold on, wait. Is it just E? Yeah, EL14. Make sure I have the code right. EL14, 14% off all day today only. And a big thanks to everybody for their support over the years for uh, that little endeavor. It's in a lot of ways led to everything else I'm doing. So uh, very excited about that. And as always, people find me on Twitter, at Scott Johnson. And as always, it was a pleasure to hang out with you guys today. Uh, absolutely, man. And glad to have you on board. And, and officially, too, uh, I mentioned yesterday, we keep kind of going over the goal and back over the goal. But we're, we're, we're over the goal today. So it's all, it's all good. Uh, thanks to our patrons. Uh, if you are a patron of the show, whether it's at patreon.com slash ace detect or just helping us out on PayPal or just telling folks about it, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, if you're not doing any of those things, you can give yourself a pat on the back after you do one of those things. You can find out all the things at dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 5932459. Listen to the show live at alphageekradio.com. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We will be back tomorrow with somebody who knows what on fleek means, Justin Robert Young. Talk to you later. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. That was a great show. What should we call it? I agree. Thank you. I have ideas. Jenny's here! Oh, Hi! I made it. She made it. She... Oh, boy. What's your ideas? It came in like a wreck and ball. <laughs> But with more clothing on. Uh, <laughs> Cold out there. Yep. Yep. All right. So Nest drops the drop cam. Uh, mm. Nest drops the drop. Mm -hmm. A paper white forever voyaging, Poetic. which I like just for its poetry. Beautiful. Um, that was TVZ Gun, by the way. Microsoft's War of Egos. Uh, I reject a reality and substitute E3s. <laughs> and rhythm's going to get you. <laughs> Which, hey, uh, let's see. <laughs> that rhythm's going to get you was pre-show, wasn't it? I don't know. Did I say? I don't remember how that came up. No, no, that was in the show. Was it? Okay. Uh, it was uh, right at the beginning when you are talking about filling in. Oh, right, right. <laughs> I am a fan of... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying I called you the Gloria Estefan of tech. That's right, that did happen. <laughs> I uh, I like keeping up with the Droneses. <laughs> really good. Yeah, that's that's really good. That was uh, who did that? 
Fred. Fred. But I'm looking for like a VR. Right said, VR. Fred. R. What is it good for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that like was Beatmaster. Beatmaster yeah. made that, that one before the show even started. Let's see. Good God, y'all! I don't. That was the. Those were the tops. Okay, VR. What is it good for? Is the best uh, main discussion related title. Sure, sure. We got some really good other ones here. Do you guys yeah. have a preference? Do anyone tickle your boat? The keep it drones has really got me. Yeah, I like the drones this one. All right, I think that's. Yeah. I think we all agree. Keeping up with the drones is it's is not, the title. Not, it connects directly to my irrational fear of kids destroying drones on my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be irrational in a couple of years. That's what I'm saying. Oh boy, that rocking chair for Christmas. And then they're going to be accused of like. Uh, not racism necessarily, but like areaism, because well, we're not sending drones to Oakland, downtown Oakland, just yet. But we'll start in uh, you know Sunnyvale, somewhere beautiful no crime area. Like Sunnyvale that's, has crime. <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't think of another one, but you know what I mean. Like I think the only one that probably would probably be um, what's the Sausalito. Yeah. I mean, just there's not there's everyone there's rich so the drones the drones of Marin. Oh, Belvedere. Belvedere will be the one that's like, no drones. We're doing our rich people things. Can you think of, can you imagine all the pranks people will pull? That's my point, man. Even if it's just, uh, even if it's simple stuff like the drone lands, drops it, kid runs up real quick, ties a, like a condom to the end of it full of jello or something, and now off flies the drone <laughs> with a condom full of jello. What about the drone that automatically TPs your house? And then you can't reach it because it's all the way like on the roof. Yep. Right, because if we weren't for drones, kids would never play pranks on anyone. Yes. The new, but yeah, no, it would take him more time, and then you could physically catch up with them. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's by the neck. It's fertile new ground is all I'm getting at. True. Fertile. True. I mean, if I was listen, if I was fourteen, this sounds like a this sounds like the best time to be alive. If you tell me there's drones parking around the house. And by the way, Raj. Uh, with full understanding and compliments, uh, go whenever you need to. If you need to crash, oh, yeah, no, no problem. I, eat I think your sandwich. I, well, no, the ice cream's gone. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you feel like. I, I know what it's like when you're trying to prop yourself up. No, no, no. I'll go. I, I think um, I just have to make myself presentable for. I, I got Blizzard this afternoon at some point. I'm just trying to figure out when. Oh, Oop. tell them we say hello. Yeah, yeah. Who you, uh, uh, who's your guy? Are you, I don't know who's down there right now. Jeremy, I think. Oh, um, uh, well, Scott gets paid in, in uh, you know, Ferraris by <laughs> to say nice things about. We all know that. Gold and transmog gear. That's yeah. Right. Uh, where are we? <laughs> uh, uh, the Australian contact's my regular one, Dan. Dan. Oh, I know Dan. Yeah. Uh, and he has hooked me up with. Is it Heroes of the Storm stuff? Is it Star Trek? Yeah, Heroes of the Storm. They, they had a big launch in Sydney uh, last week, I think, on Tuesday, but um, I was I, know, I couldn't go up there. So I'm obsessed with that game. But they they actually showed that was the best part of that PC conference yesterday was that reveal. I'm Can not, you explain like that? That was just this is extra stuff we're going to have in the release, yeah. Yeah. So the way they're doing this, it's like a two or three month period. And they're just calling it kind of the Diablo period. So basically what they're doing is they're adding a bunch of new Diablo-based heroes to Heroes of the Storm. Uh -huh. The big map they're releasing is that Eternal Conflict thing, and that is a specific, it's a Diablo-themed uh, map, which is one of the first themed maps of any of their franchises. Everything else. Yeah. That's the thing they showed off at the Heroes of the Storm YouTube event that I was they at. They did show that. Map. So last yeah, night, so cool. the Heroes of the Storm YouTube event showed that uh, map, and then they showed the... The, the Butcher is the new character. Last night, oh, and they had released Johanna the um, Crusader just before that, so we were already playing her. So now, we've last night's reveal was uh, that the next um, hero will be Leoric, King Leoric, the Skeleton King, and also the Monk is in that video, so he's being worked on. He's the first healer out of the Diablo characters, and that's it, I think. Those are the main reveals. But they're just and they, so they, and and there's a big theory that Deckard Cain will be like the last character they do at the end, um, and then they move on and like do a StarCraft theme for a while, and they go back and do a WoW theme for a while, and just part of their rollout. I really like what they're doing with it though, 
It makes me spend money. <laughs> the game is really good. I see. I've only played it. Uh, I played maybe four or five hours worth. I just mm-hmm. I was just never grabbed me. And I know this is different in many ways, but I, I'm, I'm struggling to to. Get I'm not, you're not alone. I went into it. I didn't. I've never liked MOBAs. I went in thinking, "Uh oh, another one." I don't even care if it's Blizzard. I don't like MOBAs, and it didn't click with me for a while. But the day it clicked, it just turned into a whole new world for me, and I'm having more fun here than I've had in probably years with multiplayer. Yeah, because uh, uh, Kanata won't shut up about it. That's oh, he's, he's a total. Yeah, he he and I are. Pff, we're making each other sick of each other. In fact, he's really <laughs> fun to play with. He gets really mad at the other team. <laughs> But yeah, he's he's an evangelist for sure. And my guess is, you know, they're gonna. I think they're gonna do well with it. You know, a lot of people thought it'd be hard to come in and be a third wheel in this in this uh, MOBA space, and I think they're doing it. Oh, Heroes of the Dawn. That's that was huge. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. really well done. Very excited about BlizzCon and what that'll mean. More Blizzard stuff. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. I doubt there will be EA announcements, although... Yeah. I just want them... Oh God, I just wanted them to finish StarCraft Ghost. I, just, I really wanted that game. You're that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> I'm the guy that buys a GameCube because uh, I wanted to play Rogue Squadron. Like, oh, I want to play that game. I said, oh, I guess I'll have to buy this square thing. That was actually worth it, though. Rogue Squadron and SXX a... Tricky were the things that I played constantly on Great the game. Games. Yeah. I didn't know that. I love those games. Yeah. Tom, a new thing we have in common. Da, 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 da. Oh, it's... backwards compatibility, Jets. <laughs> <laughs> you too can have your memories destroyed. Dude, tell no, me... no. You know, people say that certain, some games still hold up. Yeah, I agree. It really depends on the game. I played... I had Beyond Good and Evil on the original Xbox, and I still had the disc, and I, it worked. Uh, it didn't work on the Xbox 360, so I bought the HD revamper. It's the same game, just the, 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 the graphics have been scaled up. I still love it. It's still a good game. Yep. Good Raj, games never die. Raj, tell me if I'm right about this. The two trends I saw this year's E3 overall that weren't overt, but people or people may not notice it if they don't think about it, but lots and lots and lots of female protagonists. That was number one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah look great. And then number two, games that feature yarn in it. Yeah. <laughs> what a lot of yarn going on. A lot of yarns uh, being told. That's only two that I can think of. No, that's true. I, just, for some I reason, thought there were three. There, I thought there was one from every platform. Uh, Unravel, Yoshi's Woolly. Uh, I don't know what the other one is. Didn't Sony have one? Uh, hold on. They had something like that. Could have sworn they had one. Brief history of yarn. Probably a uh, knitting hero or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wouldn't that be great? You would have like two little knitting thingies and you would just virtually knit yourself a sweater that you can't wear in real life. <laughs> oh, do you knit? Yeah, well, I play knit hero. No, you know. I don't knit yeah, on hot. <laughs> there is a game called Knitting Mania, but it's a 2009 Canadian iPhone game. <laughs> But that's yeah. I thought there was a third, but I, I can't find. I thought there was two. Oh, Broken Age had a bunch of knitting in it. Well, anyway, that was. A... <laughs> I still um, have not finished that game. The, the okay. common thread for me was new IP. Everyone said the ter- the words we have new IP, and then played either something that was ten seconds long and made no sense whatsoever, right? Or actually gave a proper demo. So, um. It's good. You, you shouldn't. I shouldn't complain about new IP, but it seemed like they were rushing. They were all trying to say, "Look, we're not doing a sequel, or not. It's not a prequel." Right. Sony. Yes. Show that I can never remember the name of uh, the one with the girl and the dinosaurs that were robots. Horizon. Horizon looks. So that's the single thing of this entire E3 that really blew my mind. Uh, I, I had a close look yesterday, and, uh, and to me, it's Lara Croft. Rebooted with uh, what was that original PS3? It's a Heavenly Sword. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that Gorilla? Uh, Games? It's also Gorilla Games, I think. The same company. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. It, it's it looks um it looks a lot better up close than what it did 
uh, graphic wise, it, it looks really, really tight up close. This um, concept, Roger, you'd love this. This concept of like mankind has died out. Our husks of old cities are just there as relics. Why would I like this? Well, here's why. Because then <laughs> humans, humans are like cavemen again. They're starting over, sort of. And they just know these ancient stories of this civilization long gone. But the animal life in the world appears to be all like robots that were left, after we all died out, machines were left to evolve naturally almost as wildlife without yeah. no controls or anything. And so... Weird animals and creatures all over the place, including big dinosaur-looking things, are these big robotic machinery things. It's, so it's, all the animatronics from Disneyland somehow <laughs> come to life, and we'll see descendants of the animatronic Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. And the, only, the, only answer, the only answer to animatronic Abe Lincoln and his and his dear wife Chuck E. Cheese. And it'll I mean, be just like Feeger from glorious. Star Trek: The Motion Picture, where Bolt. you need to communicate. To Communicate to them in some very simplified, basic electrical language, like like Morse code or something. Yeah. Dee, 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 dee. Really? Um, I, I I did get a closer <laughs> look at Last Guardian as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, that looked really good to me too. Yeah, it. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, do they have enough to be able to make a call at this point? Um, what they showed behind doors was another five minutes on the front of what they showed at the conference, which scares me. Mm. Uh, because they didn't have that much to show? In other words, they yeah. took, they only have ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. So um, is it... And, and it looks exactly like it did in 2009. Yeah. That's, that's another thing that scares me. Is this the same group that did um, Shadow of the Colossus? Yeah, yeah, same yeah. guys. Yeah. Um, Oh, it, it was just the one puzzle sort of area, and and, and that was it. But um, when it was jammed in between seeing Horizon, then you then you watch another fifteen minutes of Last Guardian, and then you watch thirty minutes of Uncharted Four, which is just amazing. Yeah. Uh, it kind of picks the middle one up a little bit, so um, I'm not holding my breath for the Last Guardian anymore. Yeah, it's hard to. Well, they've been on it for so long. Who knows what the crap's going on? Yeah. Um, now I'm meeting Josh Witteki. Sure. Not Josh Mascara? Uh, nope. That's the Diablo head. I don't know who that is. Hmm. Yeah, I thought you knew everyone. Well, I did too. I guess I'm not as in their back pocket as we all thought. <laughs> By the way, I've, I've been meaning to tell you, Scott, I am very uh, pleased as a listener with the idea that the instance will formally branch out into covering Blizzard properties. Well, that's good general. feedback. Yeah, we've had yeah. actually we haven't had any negative reaction. I think it may be just the right time. It felt right, and everybody was feeling that way. And I've always kind of wanted that. Mm -hmm. And I know, like you've got, you've had, you know, the 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 memes of like, you know, stick to the topic and everything. But I've always liked when you branched out yeah. into the other. It's IPs. very freeing. It's a very yeah. uh, like last week, especially uh, all four of us. I just I just felt like this weird release on, on the show of like, oh yeah, we can talk about Hearthstone to our heart's content if we want because something big happened this week, and if Heroes is a big talk, we'll do that. And and guess what? The Wow patch. Ooh, great. Like it. It was always kind of a Blizzard enthusiast show anyway. I feel like I'm just now bowing to the powers that be. It's just the way it's... Well, when you started the show, World of Warcraft was pr the predominant thing that Blizzard did. That was their game. You yeah. know? Uh, and you're just following Blizzard's own path, which is like World of Warcraft, still very big, yep. not abandoning it, yep. but gotta, gotta branch out into other things to keep growing. It's in a weird way, I've, I'm almost... The show is mimicking what they are doing. Yeah. And and I was talking to Chris Metzen about that, and he talks about how freeing that's been for those guys, and it's weirdly freeing for me. I don't feel nearly as not stifled, not the word. I just was yeah, always yeah. toey and had to be careful, and now I don't feel that way, and and I haven't had a single complaint. So I feel like maybe it was the right time to, you know, like it, it wouldn't have worked a year ago or two years ago or something. And um, ELR is coming back next next month. Is it part of that? Everybody's all set for ER, ELR's big comeback all the time. I get that every week, I swear. I think your answer, Scott, should always be, yeah, ELR's comeback is next week. <laughs> every time you're asked. <laughs> A lot of people really miss that show.
Yeah, I missed that show. Too. I missed that show. It was great. We had oh, a, that, that was like, one of my first big podcast talks. Was it really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, people have a fond memory of it. With the comic hitting 14 years, that means the show hitting about, well, officially the show hitting about 10 years. Feeling pretty nostalgic about all of it. One day, though. And old. Maybe I'll get O and we'll do some kind of one-off sometime just to make everybody happy and have them realize that it wasn't as good as they thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, doesn't, this, isn't, this is like playing an old video game. It's like, uh, I don't know. What's a game? I can't think of one. Like, everyone thinks Banjo-Kazooie was the end-all, be-all on the N64. It's not really that great. Toy so, Bazaar on the Commodore 64. There you go. Amazing game. It just do a one-off show called ELR Backwards Compatible. Or something. There you go. It's not bad. How yeah. about uh, Shenmue? Because <laughs> I think Shen everyone was so excited about the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter, and I went... No. No, that game uh, not good. That's a bad game. <laughs> you know what? It's This is the thing. People love Shenmue, really love it. And people who... Like, I'm sort of ambivalent. I can see where people like it. One of the things that really bugged me about the game, and this might just be a very, like, hardcore... Like, I can see a hardcore guy is really liking the game. But, like, it's just really tedious to get to the fun part. Like, to play through it is just really, like, it's work. Like, and it's not fun. Like, I'm enjoying myself. It's like, oh, i got to ask all these people the same freaking question about the car and the kittens. And then, oh, I get to drive a forklift. Ooh. Like, if I wanted to live a dull life, I wouldn't have to play a video game because my life is sort of dull already. Because you drive a forklift. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, have you really? Played? I mean, it's, I, it's I, the hype. I mean, that video games are about escapism. It's not about taking over someone else's, <laughs> you know, mediocre life. And it is. It's a pretty mediocre, you know, I, I don't know, people... I'll probably get, I'll probably get uh, pilloried for this, but uh, it's just... Uh, the story's just very so-so. It's not at all that interesting. I don't know. Well, Angry on that uplifting note, I'm out of the post. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Stay tuned for Sword and Laser's interview with Beth Cato following PM Magazine's look at a monkey whose bananas for basketball. <laughs>